The writer of Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's the same important message that we get today from the Old Testament prophet Haggai. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're here for another important study with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. But before we jump into Haggai, we got more of our continuing study on God's judgments. Yesterday, Dr. McGee told us that God not only intends to judge the house of Israel, but he will also bring the people back into the land and make them a nation. Here's more. Now, Isaiah had something to say about it. In fact, a great deal. In Isaiah, the 26th chapter, verse 20, he says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. That's a great tribulation. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall this close her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In other words, there's also going to be the judgment of the nations, and we're going to look at that also, but probably at another time, because we don't want to take too much time in these introductory matters. Now, the Scripture has a great deal to say about this. If you go over to the prophecy of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, he says, but who may abide the day of his coming. Now, that's chapter 3, verse 2. And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem Be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. You see, a time of judgment before they can enter the land in peace and plenty and prosperity of the kingdom. And that is the chronological order and the logical order of Scripture all the way through, by the way. Now, when you come to the New Testament, we sometimes try to work the church in And especially in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is about the kingdom of heaven. And in the 24th and 25th chapters, we have here passages that make it very clear that God intends to judge the nation Israel. And then he intends to bring those into the kingdom that were the wise virgins, that were the foolish virgins. And only the wise could finally enter in. Now, those ten virgins are the nation Israel. They're not the church. The church is the virgin bride of Christ and comes with him at that time. But the Lord Jesus, for the great marriage supper, will judge the nation Israel to see who's going to enter into the kingdom. So this is a judgment of the nation Israel, which is separate from the other nations. This week on the World Prayer Team, we're praying for home groups throughout India, such an exciting part of our ministry. And yesterday, we were praying for people who speak Malayalam. So I've got Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, in the studio with us to talk a little bit about that exciting ministry. Oh, boy, I love to talk about this. TTB Malayalam has been on the air since 1982 with George Philip, the man who said, if you cut me, I bleed, Dr. McGee. Yeah, Yeah, he is a great Uh, guy. He says Dr. McGee changed his life. He went from being just, just, quote, uh, producer of Malayalam to heading up all of TWR India. He's been a fantastic leader. Yeah. And I don't know if people realize this. India is such a massive yeah, country with so many is. languages. 45 million people speak Malayalam. Yeah. So if you think, oh, this is kind of a sub-language. No, yeah. it's a big <laughs> it's group. It's a big one. And a lot of Christian leaders come out of this language group. Hmm. But we, Steve, we've gotten some great responses, uh, especially during the COVID crisis, but just Malayalam has just been so fruitful. So why don't you read us this first email? Sure. This is from a TTB listener in Malayalam. As we have heard about through the Bible from our neighbors, we came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. My mother-in-law opposed this, but after some time, she too started to listen to the Bible studies. Mother was a bit reluctant, (laughs) but she too could not deny the truth, and she too believed in the name of Jesus Christ. 
We are growing. We realize many things we practice are against the Bible, so we have destroyed the idols which we kept at our home. That is such a key thing for them to understand, especially in India with a Hindu background. We are grateful for this teaching that has brought us closer to God. Yeah, Hindus worship over 300 million gods. Yeah, so everybody's it is got one. Very significant. Now, here's a great one. My children have grown, and my husband runs a business and comes home only once a week. After finding out about my husband's affairs, I didn't want to live anymore. Hmm. I felt lonely. At that time, my daughter introduced me to your teaching that she studies as a home group. Through God's word, I have been made new and strengthened. Why should I be afraid when there is a God who loves me so much and gave his life for me? Thank you for helping me grow in Jesus Christ and to live every day peacefully through the Spirit. Yeah, this is such an exciting letter because it not only focuses on her growth, but also on the home groups that we're doing in India. Wish we had more time to talk about it. (laughs) Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin? Father, thank you for moving powerfully through your word and help us to continue to get it to the whole world and watch you do more and more wonderful things. And we pray that you'll move powerfully in our lives as we study your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, it's well to keep before us here the outline that Haggai is giving to us because this is a very orderly little book. This man, Haggai, is organized. He is an administrator. He's a man that's right down to earth. He's out under helping them rebuild the temple and encouraging them all the time and challenging them. And we've had in this first 11 verses a challenge to the people. That is, first of all, that was a charge of conflict of interest. They were putting their own selfish interests against the program of God. And that was the reason the temple was not rebuilt. And they were giving the excuse that it just simply wasn't the time to build. And then God asked them to consider their ways, that actually God was judging them, and they didn't seem to recognize it. They were hardened to the fact that the trouble they were having, the problems, was the judgment of God upon them. And he called them to consider their ways. And then he gave them a command to construct the temple, a command to construct the temple, And the solution to their problem was very simple. They were to go up to the mountains, cut down trees. Second, they were to bring wood to make lumber. And then they were to build a house, the temple of God. A three-point sermon there, but not a very exciting one, I must say. And it was just as simple as this. And the results would be great, though. God would be pleased, and God would be glorified. You see, they were then putting God first, and then what would happen? Well, material blessings had been withheld. He made that very clear, and he reviews their conditions and clearly states the reason for it. They had failed to build a temple. Now we come here in verse 12 through the rest of the chapter, the response to the challenge. First, the construction of the temple in verse 12. The people obeyed. Notice this. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Now they did two things. Here, they obeyed, obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Obedience. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just keeps on cleansing us from all sin. We must walk in the light of the Word of God. And the Word of God will humble us. It will show us our failures and all of that. And a great many of us don't like to have them called to our attention. But if we will look at them and deal with them, then we'll find the blood of Jesus Christ just keeps on cleansing us from all sin, and we'll have fellowship with God. And so the people obeyed God, and they feared. That's the second thing. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. These people not only believed God, they obeyed God, and they feared God. Now, will you notice? And they have now a confirmation from God. Notice now verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, Then spoke Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Now, could you ask for anything more than that, friends? He says, I am with you. I'm with you. The Lord Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you until the end of the age. And that rested upon obedience, you see. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he didn't say, I will be with you if you sit upon your haunches and you don't do anything for God. He never said he'd be with you there. He said, I'm with you when you obey me. And that is the place of blessing. And we can have fellowship with him. I am with you, saith the Lord. You can't improve on that. You can't have anything better than that. And so what happens here now? The leaders, they enter enthusiastically into the work. Notice verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, this is pretty important to see. The leadership of the nation, the civil leader, Zerubbabel, the governor, and he was in the kingly line. He was actually the son of Shealtiel. That word, Shealtiel, is an interesting word. It means asking of God in prayer. So there was a lot of prayer back of this also. Now, will you notice they came and did work in the house of the Lord. And Joshua, here's the high priest. And then we're told the remnant of the people that had come back. So that here's a joining together of government, and citizens, and religion, the God-given religion in that day. Now, this took place in verse 15, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Now, this was September the 24th, 520. Now, the first message was given on September the 1st, 520. That's when God challenged him. Now they responded to the challenge here, and on September the 24th, why Haggai gave them the second message. Because what had happened? The people have now come together. They're organized. They're going to start work. And they're beginning now to cut down the trees, bring the logs down, make it into lumber, and they are beginning to build. I suppose at this time, the foundation was laid, and probably a few of the uprights around the temple, they were in place. Now we come to chapter 2, and when we come here to chapter 2, we come to the discouragement of the people and the encouragement of the Lord, and that's in the first nine verses. Now, this took place on October the 21st, 520. Now, will you notice this? And this is the third message and it's dated here, verse 1 of chapter 2 of Haggai, in the seventh month. You see, the other took place in the sixth month. In the one and twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying. Now they had been working a month. They spent about 24 days getting organized, probably getting the foundation down. And now for a month, the temple is beginning to go up. And there's great enthusiasm about all of this. God has encouraged them. God says, I'm with you. Now we come to the second item of discouragement. Now, will you notice what God says here in verse 2? Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, now, this is a message that is directed now to the same group of people that God had encouraged in the last chapter. Same leaders and the same people. 
Now we come to the second hurdle that Haggai had to clear as the prophet. Now you must remember all the times Zechariah is prophesying along with him, but we'll get to Zechariah next time. Now that is the next prophet we take up. Now here was the problem, and will you notice it? He says, verse 3 now of the second chapter of Haggai, who is left among you that saw this house in its first glory, and how do you see it now? It's not in your eyes in comparison with it as nothing. In other words, this was the thing that was happening. You see, many of those who had returned from the Babylonian captivity They remembered, though many of them had been very young at the time of the captivity, they could remember the beauty and the richness of Solomon's temple. Now, in comparison, this little temple they're putting up, sort of like a shotgun house, just a little long, what would be called a long house. And in comparison, this temple here, it looked like a tenant farmer's barn in Georgia compared to the richness of the temple of Solomon, that temple, by the way, it was ornate. It was rich in every detail. And the thing about it is, this temple here just didn't seem to measure up at all. Now, will you notice that Solomon's temple had not really been a great temple. That is, it had not been a large temple by any means. And I suppose that the people here that could remember the other one, they could remember it in all of its beauty. They could remember the richness of it and how ornate it was and the jewels that had been put in it, the gold that had been put in it, and the silver. Actually, the Temple of Solomon, it's been variously estimated how much wealth really went into the construction of it And you can get figures anywhere from $5 million to $20 million. Well, friends, that's quite a difference, of course. And it certainly is not like our national debt by any means. It's not that much. But in that day, believe me, this was quite a bit of wealth. Whether it's 5 or $20 million would make any difference. That temple was a jewel box. It was a thing of beauty. Now, the thing that had happened was simply this, that as this temple went up, and you notice the date that he gave this message, it was the seventh month in the one and twentieth day of the month. Now, that's quite interesting. If you check into that, if you go over to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and look at the feast days, you'll find out that this was the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, the final feast of ingathering for the year. And I'm of the opinion that the people had pressed forward in order to get the temple as far along as possible in order to use it for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this building never was, even when it was completed, never was as ornate as Solomon's. And when many of the old-timers came in, that was the absence of the jewels and of the silver and gold. We're going to see that in this chapter here, that it lacked all of that beauty and all of that wealth that characterized Solomon's temple. So the thing that happened when the people went, apparently, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and this is just a construction that's just hurriedly now fixed so it can be used. And you know any kind of a building, whether it's a house or a great office building, before it's completed, it sure doesn't look good. It's not impressive, you see. You have to wait until the building is finished to appreciate it. And this building was not finished. But actually, there was no comparison between this building and Solomon's temple. So there was mingled and mixed reaction to it. In fact, I'm going back to the book of Ezra. And I'd like to read there some verses from the book of Ezra that I think will help us if you have your Bible. Maybe you'd like to go back with us to the third chapter of the book of Ezra. And when we get back there, we are going to turn to 
the third chapter, and I think I'll go back and begin reading at verse 8 here. Now listen to this. Now in the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity under Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward, and set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then took Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he's good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So you see, they had to celebrate it with just the foundation and maybe a few uprights there. Now will you notice, verse 12, but many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men, that is, they were old men, that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before the eyes, they wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Well, but amidst all the shout of joy, there was also this other shout. It wasn't a shout. It was a weeping and a howling because they were making a comparison between the two. They said, look, this little temple that you're putting up here, it doesn't amount to a row of beans or a hill of beans. It doesn't amount to anything at all. It's so little and inconsequential in comparison to the Temple of Solomon. And you know, if you want to dampen a project, that's all you have to do is to say, well, boys, you may think it's great, but you should have seen the original or back in the good old days. And that used to be the thing I heard as a boy, the good old days. Then when I got older, I heard people talking about the good old days when I was a boy. I don't remember any good old days when I was a boy. May I say to you, those were hard, difficult days then. I remember that my first little church I served down there in Georgia. If you ever come to my study here, I'll show you a picture of it. I'm looking at it right now. By that city there now, oh, they have a brick church now. But this was a little white structure. At least it was white one time. We finally painted that, and it's on a red clay hill down there in Georgia. My first year there as a student pastor, we had a meeting during the summer. I preached a series of evangelistic messages on the book of Revelation. I haven't been able to do that since then, but I did it then. And God bless. We had many young people that were saved. And that last Sunday night, in the warmth of that Georgia evening, we sat out on the steps, and I'm looking at them here. And we were talking, all of us young folk, of how wonderful a meeting had been. And then there was an old boy there. He had whiskers, looked like Methuselah. He said, well, now you had a pretty good meeting, young man. But he says, I remember, oh, brother, when they start that, you are headed for the toboggan and you're going down the hill. And he took us for the ride down the hill. He said, now, when I was a young man, we really had a meeting here. And then he began to tell us about the meeting. And I was really looked pretty small that we had had compared to his. But I understand he exaggerated just a little. May I say to you, this was discouragement. How will Haggai overcome this? Or better, how will God overcome it? We'll see next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
If you need more encouragement from God's Word, we can help. You can call us at 1-865-BIBLE or visit us at ttb.org to check out the resources that we offer to help you deepen your personal study of the Bible. And to study with us over the weekend, join me for Dr. McGee's Sunday sermon titled, A Law Concerning Cleansing. On Monday, we'll continue with this down-to-earth, practical study of Haggai. I look forward to your company on the Bible bus. Jesus, take it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Our story on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too? 